We're a month away from Election Day, where Oregonians will have several big ballot measures to consider. Among them, a controversial measure that would repeal Oregon's sanctuary state law. We want to help and take down the barriers to law enforcement to enforce our laws. We'll break down several of the measures. Also tonight, Oregon's only Republican member of Congress faces a vocal Democratic opponent in Oregon's vast second district. We'll hear from Greg Walden as he defends his seat. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Oregon voters will be getting their ballots in about 10 days. In addition to important political races, you'll also be deciding on a wide range of measures, including one that would restrict abortion. Another would repeal the state sanctuary law, and yet another would ban a tax on groceries. Plus, there's an affordable housing bond for voters in the metro. KGW political analyst Len Bergstein joins us to give us a rundown on these important decisions. Plus, Oregon 2nd District Congressman Republican Greg Walden is running for his 11th term in the U.S. House. We'll hear from him later in the show. First, let's get to Len Bergstein and talk about those ballot measures. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's great to have you here. Hi, Laurel. Good to see you again. This is interesting. I, you know, my first uh, impression was that this wasn't going to be a very interesting ballot measure season. But as you look at them, they're, we're voting on things that have to do with money, with values, and with power. And so it, it couldn't be a more interesting uh, uh, ballot season. Do so you think people will actually turn out to vote on some of these measures? I think so. And in some cases, the values ones particularly may have an interesting driver in terms of getting younger people to the polls when you're ish, de dealing with this immigrant issue and abortion issue. I think those will have an effect on voter turnout. Let's take a look at the measures. Let's start with measure 103, and that is the grocery tax measure. You've probably seen a lot of ads for and against this measure. A yes vote would ban local and state taxes on groceries actually amends the state constitution. Now, Len, the grocery industry is behind this one. We don't even have a sales tax, so why is it on the ballot? Well, that's exactly the right question. I mean, what problem are we solving? The grocery interests and the retailers are saying, we're nervous that this state uh, goes after big companies to kind of get revenues to fund state government. So we're worried about that, as particularly in light of the ballot measure we had in 97 a couple of cycles ago. So they said, let's carve ourselves out and say that we can't be taxed. That means uh, no tax on sugary beverages. So that's why the beverage industry is in there for a million dollars. And no tax on some other things. But what's caused the confusion now, as you know, we talked about is, is that people are not sure what actually is food. Is it food that you consume? Uh, right away, or does it have something to do with uh, groceries, truck drivers, kind of other kinds of fuel taxes? Because this says it's farm to fork. Yeah, exactly. Covers so, a lot. And lawyers are having a kind of field day chatting about what the interpretation actually is. So it's unclear what we're really fighting about or why this is necessary, but it's a big issue to some uh, businesses. Another one that's a money issue also related to Measure 97 is Measure 104. It doesn't sound really exciting, but it's it's really important. It's the supermajority measure. It would require three-fifths vote of legislators in each chamber to not only approve tax bills, as they do right now, but any proposals that result in increased revenue to the state. What is this all about? Well, it's interesting, and it has to do with what goes on inside Salem. You're 100% right. What happens here is that we're, nobody says if you're going to tax people, if you're going to have a new tax on people's property or income, that that doesn't have to get three-fifths. That's crystal clear. But what happens if you take away a tax deduction or remove a tax credit and, uh, in a variety of ways or fees that somebody doesn't have to pay? Gets more money into the, uh, the state coffers and, in fact, raises revenue. Is that the kind of thing that needs three-fifths? Which are real Realtors are backing God, this Oregon going Association crazy. of Realtors because they don't want to lose that mortgage interest rate. It's deduction. exactly right. And so they're into it big time. They're afraid about that. But there also were other groups who said, what about fees? What about licenses? Whatever. So there's a business coalition. There's also uh, small individuals who are concerned about it. There was some fight when the federal government changed the tax laws as to whether or not Oregon was going to connect with that system or disconnect. And that would have had some impact on revenue to the state state and tax credits to certain people. So that generated some excitement. So there's people who are kind of concerned about the details here. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't affect everybody. It really has a big impact on the way government works. And Democrats would say this is an attempt by business community or Republicans to try and keep the majority from run, from running the, the, the state government. And opponents say it would it would create gridlock. Let's look at the Portland Measure 26201, and that is called the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Initiative, or the Portland Gross Receipts Tax, depending on who you ask about this. Yeah. It imposes a one percent tax or surcharge on certain retailers to fund clean energy and job training. What can you tell us about this one, Len? I think this is one that your viewers should really pay attention to because it has a potential to be a game changer. It'll create, if it passes, a $30 million fund that will basically be used for green infrastructure, for helping people fix up their homes, particularly in low income and communities of colors communities. So it's something that's got a broad wide-ranging coalition, probably unlike anything we've seen before in Portland politics, and it has a big potential towards getting money into these communities and really reinforcing them. I, we were talking about this before. I grew up in Portland in the 70s political system where the neighborhood associations really gained a lot of power, as opposed to that we have a, a park along the Willamette. We don't have a Mount Hood freeway. This measure has the potential to empower a group that's worked really hard in communities of color to uh, increase their infrastructure and their own lives, and it could have a dramatic impact on politics in Portland. City Club of Portland has endorsed this, I understand, yeah. and the Portland Business Alliance and its 1,900 members are opposed exactly, to it. Exactly. We're going to look at Measure 105 now. That's the sanctuary law bill. A yes vote would repeal the sanctuary law, forbidding state resources from being used to apprehend persons violating federal immigration laws. A no vote would keep the state's 31-year-old sanctuary law in place. We had representatives from both the yes and the no campaigns here on Straight Talk just a couple of weeks ago. Let's listen to what they said about this. We want to help and take down the barriers to law enforcement to enforce our laws. This is not a nationwide issue. This is a state issue. This has nothing to do with what's going on on the border. This has to do with what's happening in Oregon. Trust is the foundation of good policing and that when local police act as an arm of the federal immigration agents, then many immigrants will feel too fearful to come forward to report a crime if they've been victimized or if they've witnessed a crime to provide important information to help solve a case. Len, can you tell us more about who's behind the Yes campaign, the people who want to repeal the sanctuary law? It, it's a combination of both a national group that wants to repeal these kinds of laws and are supporting the Trump administration's immigration policies uh, to kind of close the borders and be tough on immigrants. That's that group. And then there's a local group called Oregonians for uh, Immigration Reform that's locally. Now, they've had, they've had some of their own problems. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Centers indicated that these are groups that are really kind of behind a lot of, um, you know, kind of hate kinds of issues. Which they've denied. They've denied that. And so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a controversy in itself. So what we've got is we've got groups who seem to, the issue raises Oregon values, really dramatically, we saw it in the clips. This is a situation that brings up in people's minds profiling in the past uh, of uh, um, racial groups, and so on and so forth, and concerned now about immigrant groups, and also the question, the whole question of, is our immigration policy moving in the right direction or wrong? So we're fighting out in Oregon a kind of a very significant values group, and I think the, the no campaign has really kind of hit its messaging, and I think they're doing probably a better job of delivering their message that this is a anti, you want to vote anti-profiling uh, as opposed to kind of pro-restriction on sa uh, sanctuary issues. And to clarify, a yes vote would repeal the sanctuary right. law, a no vote would keep the sanctuary law right. in place that's been on the books for 31 years. Oregon's support of abortion rights is being tested with this ne next measure. It's measure 106. It would restrict abortion and it amends the state constitution and would prohibit spending public funds for abortion and on health plans that cover abortion, there are exceptions for ectopic pregnancies and for a pregnant woman in danger of death due to her physical condition. The bottom line, the measure reduces abortion access and a no vote retains the current law. What's the origin of this measure, Len? Well, I think this fight is going on all over the country and it, uh, in terms of abortion issues. As a matter of fact, there are only three states where there's a real abortion issue now. Alabama, West Virginia, and Oregon are the only states in the country that are dealing with this. But Oregon has traditionally been the most uh, open to reproductive rights for women uh, in the country. So the, the folks who want to kind of carve back on that 
that are having this fight all around the country are saying, let's test met, uh, market some messages in Oregon. If we can see how these messages go. And the message that they're trying to say is, why should you, uh, taxpayer, pay for somebody else's choice? Uh, abortions are okay, but funding abortions is really the problem we want to bring to your attention. Obviously, the no campaign is saying, wait a minute, this is a backdoor ban on abortions and limits, as you said, access. And so they're trying to make this a very much of an up or down issue on where Port Oregon has been very clear about wanting to protect uh, women's reproductive rights. With what we see going on in the Supreme Court, do you see this issue possibly bringing a lot of people out to vote? Oh, I think you're right. I think this will have a perverse impact. If the conservatives wanted to kind of test market some messages, they may be doing it at the cost of bringing out and energizing young voters, women, uh, and progressives. And that may, in fact, play itself out in some other races, like the governor's race. This is an interesting issue. The Metro housing bond is measure 26199, and it's for three counties, for voters in Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah counties. It was referred to the people of the tri-counties by the Metro Regional Council. The measure authorizes more than $650 million in general obligation bonds to fund affordable housing in Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah counties for low-income families, seniors, veterans, and people with disabilities. Is it unusual, Len, to see a bond that covers three counties like that? It is, and so the people who are saying vote yes on this are saying it's a regional problem. Nobody denies that there's a regional problem or a crisis for lo affordable housing. And so we need a regional response. They're really using uh, Metro as kind of the vehicle uh, for raising property taxes during a large group and then sending that money out in a proportion to where the problem is throughout the Tri-County area. So yes, you're right, it's a little unusual. On the other hand, it's a big issue. Everybody says we've got to have more money. So is the $60 a month, is a year that it will cost taxpayers on their home, is that worth it to try and generate $650 million of bond revenues that can be applied uh, together with a constitutional amendment uh, that allows monies, if, the, if uh, voters vote yes, to use those monies on private and nonprofit housing projects as well as public projects, the reach could extend quite a bit in terms of the problem. The no vote says it's a drop in the bucket. You're, you know, it's not going to solve the problems. You're giving Metro more power than they, we, they were supposed to have. And so it's kind of like a Rorschach test, an inkblot test. It depends on how you feel about government solving this as opposed to government getting out of the way and letting the market solve it. The, the measure says that it would pay for 2,400 affordable housing units. And then that companion measure you're talking about is Measure 102. That's right. And that, um, actually changes the Constitution, amends the Constitution, to allow local bonds for financing affordable housing with non-governmental entities. What does that mean? Well, at one time, I mean, you can understand the reason behind it. Some people who were reformers didn't want the government to bond and then just hand the money over to maybe their best friends in the private sector. So it was a kind of a reform, a kind of a handcuffs on government. What's happened is that it's been more than handcuffs. It's really kept the ability to kind of produce, because the private sector and the non-profit sector can produce so many more housing than a, just a housing authority. We ought to have the money go through local housing authorities, and that's what Metro's would do with this measure, but it ought to open it up so that you can have private sector and non-profit housing experts building these more of these units. And, and we see a difference in, in the governor's candidates on this. Yeah. Uh, Representative Newt Bueller, Republican candidate for governor's, come out against the bond saying he doesn't think higher property taxes should be used to pay for more affordable housing. And of course, supporters do want to see that measure 102 that we were talking about pass. I want to get to one of the measures that is really interesting in Washington Washington state, and that is the carbon tax. Washington state is taking on climate change with initiative 1631. It's a carbon tax to cut fossil fuel dependency starting in 2020. A similar tax failed two years ago. So how, how is this different, Len? Tell us about this issue. Well, this is a big issue. At least it's attracting a lot of money. $20 million campaign. It's the second most expensive campaign that Washington's had recently. The GMO one, which we covered a lot a couple of years ago, was a more expensive. But what I think people are saying now is that people are more aware of the greenhouse gas problem. They're more willing to have the state take an aggressive uh, action in, the, um, uh, in doing things. The, it was defeated last time by people who said it's very confusing and it treats different energy producers in, uh, in different ways. And quite frankly, small businesses and mom and pop uh, consumers are going to be the ones who bear the burden. That was the way it was defeated last time. Some 
some of those same messages are going on this time. And uh, Washington's been through that ballot measure. A legislator has tried to push something through the state legislature, wasn't successful. So this is one of those cases where familiarity may breed more of an uh, effort to kind of vote yes. Only about 20 seconds left. Is this a response by Washington to Trump administration policies? I think so. It's more like the uh, state trying to take uh, its own destiny in its own hands and kind of have some tools, like a big chunk of money to be able to apply towards, uh, you know, green uh, infrastructure and uh, things that will reward uh, policies that, and practices that will uh, attack greenhouse gas uh, problems. Uh, it could have an effect on Oregon uh, because we'll be looking at cap and trade and other kinds of things this time around. So uh, uh, voters or viewers should watch what goes on there because it'll have an impact in Oregon. KGW political analyst Len Bergstein, thank you for joining us. We'll yeah. see you on election night. Great. Good talking with you. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Oregon Congressman Greg Walden, the only Republican in Oregon's congressional delegation. We're back in two minutes.